introduce our keynote speaker today. Many of you, of course, know her as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. Of course, all of you know her as our president of Ireland, who served from 1990 to 1997. And of course, as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002. She also sits on the advisory board of Sustainable Energy for All and is a member of the lead group of Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Between 2013 and 2016, Mrs. Robinson served as UN Secretary General's Special Envoy in three roles. First, for the Great Lakes region of Africa, then on to climate change, and most recently as a Special Envoy on El Nino and climate. And this week, I'm very excited to hear that she was appointed as chair of the late Nelson Mandela's Council of Elders, which is a truly awesome responsibility. Uh, if you haven't seen her appearance on the Late Late Show last Friday, uh, I can say that it's a very meaningful and positive contribution both to the international climate policy context and also to our own domestic context here at home. Will you please give a warm welcome to Mrs. Mandela? After my own heart, I must say. I thank the four organizations that have brought us together, and I also was pleased that before coming in here, they will get some flavor of the marketplace of ideas outside. The struggle to secure climate justice is a global struggle, from my friend Hindu's community in Chad to, and she'll tell you more about that, uh, to our own communities here in Ireland. Climate change is already affecting all of our lives. In a report of his visit to Ireland last month, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to a Healthy Environment, David Boyd, stated that there is no doubt that climate change is already violating the right to life and other human rights. He warns that in the future, these violations will expand in terms of geographic scope, severity, and the number of people affected, unless effective measures are implemented in the short term to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect natural carbon sinks. Only a global movement can mobilize the transformation needed to prevent an irreversible climate crisis, and only a climate just transformation, one that protects the rights of all people, can be sustainable and protect both people and the planet. And this is why I am encouraging everyone in Ireland to make the issue personal to them and personal to their family, to reduce their consumption, to reuse and recycle and become more energy efficient. If we all take it more seriously personally and in our families, we will put more pressure on government to take more action and that can happen all over the world. And again, I want to congratulate the enthusiastic people, including school children that I met in the marketplace, who are coming up with some really very good ideas that we hear about later. I want to talk today about realizing a just transition to a 1.5 degrees um, uh, warming world, or 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Global Warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius, released last month, heralds the end of the fossil fuel era. We've entered a new reality. Fossil fuel companies have lost their legitimacy and social license to operate. Just as it is with tobacco, selling a product that is known to cause harm is not socially or ethically acceptable. What is required now is a just transition to a cleaner, healthier world, one which protects people and their rights as we embrace unprecedented levels of climate action. We need to jumpstart a collective consciousness to save ourselves, and that consciousness must have justice and the protection of people and their rights at its core. Limiting global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius would reduce the number of people exposed to climate risk and poverty by several millions by 2050. It would reduce the risk of drought, extreme pre precipitation, and hot extremes and compared to warming at about 2 degrees Celsius. But even at 1.5 degrees, climate risks are inevitable and they will disproportionately affect the poorest and most vulnerable people and communities in all countries. 
with least developed countries and small island developing states among the countries most at risk. These risks are to health, to food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth. And all of risks increase the more the planet warms. So climate action on an unprecedented scale is required. Due to the pace and magnitude of this global transition, it will pose risks to human rights and sustainable development if not carefully managed. For example, 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways include large-scale land use changes to road fuel for bioenergy that could compete with food production and cause food insecurity. When we think back to the push for biofuels in the 2000s, we recall how it displaced land for growing food to grow fuel, resulting in food prices volatility. It increased pressures on land in all regions of the world, causing local communities to fear evictions, small food producers to be priced out of land markets, and led people to protest in the streets to highlight the rising price of stable foods. Ethics and human rights can help to manage and reduce the risks of climate action at the pace and scale needed to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. The IPCC special report finds that, and I quote, the design of the mitigation portfolios and policy instruments to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius will largely determine the overall synergies of trade-offs between mitigation and sustainable development. I'm very happy that in my foundation, we found a way of saying this, it's much less technical. <laughs> and what it means is, in order to reduce the risks posed to people and their development by climate action, all climate action has to be informed by human rights and equity. In fact, action to achieve the one by activities goal can go hand in hand and have multiple synergies with sustainable development, poverty reduction, and reducing inequality if designed with people and their rights at the very centre. A zero carbon future is compatible with a zero poverty future if justice and rights inform the transition. So I'd like to discuss what this means in the context of a just transition. The concept of a just transition has its origins in the labour movement, aiming to secure the future and livelihoods of workers and their communities in the transition to a low carbon economy. It's based on social dialogue, participation, and a commitment to human rights. It's an economy-wide process that produces the plans, policies, and investments that lead to a future where all jobs are green and decent, greenhouse gas emissions are at net zero, poverty is eradicated, and communities are thriving and resilient. This transition has already begun. It will be down to national and local governments to work with unions and the fossil fuel companies to ensure that workers in the fossil fuel industry are not forgotten in this global struggle to save our planet. The challenge we face is to design and manage the next industrial revolution, transition to a zero carbon, climate resilient future with minimal negative impacts and effects on workers and their communities. There are unfortunately too many examples of unjust transitions away from fossil fuels. We're all acutely aware, those of us certainly who are old enough, are acutely aware of the suffering brought about by the closure of coal mines in England, Wales, and Scotland during the 1980s. Colonies were shut down and the miners went out on strike. The Margaret Thatcher government, vilifying the unions and the workers who stood up for their rights, were plunged into poverty. Communities in Durham, Kent, Yorkshire, South Wales, and Central Scotland, the heartlands of the Industrial Revolution, were left to bear the brunt of the social, economic, and environmental fallout from the mining closures, and indeed suffer to some extent still today. In my book, Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future, I tell the story of Ken Smith, a lead sign copper miner and a union leader from Canada. His story captures the complexity of challenges and opportunities presented by a just transition. Ken realized that the mine he worked in and that his community relied on was inevitably going to close as zinc prices were collapsing on the global market. He decided to prepare for the worst 
and negotiated a closure agreement with both the government and the mining company to fund the development of a just plan. The transition plan focused on providing support for workers to cushion against redundancy, training new skills, and source new employment in the Bathurst area. Ken and his union colleagues even succeeded in securing the creation of a national program to recognize and certify the skills and competences of mining workers so they could move from place to place. As a result, Ken and many of his friends and co-workers secured new jobs in the Alberta oil sands thousands of miles away from Bathurst. But they didn't manage to create new jobs that would allow them to stay at home. And many members of the community didn't want to leave, or indeed couldn't leave, due to family commitments and ties. Marriages and families broke up as the men in the community moved away to find work, and Bathurst lost its soul. For Ken, age 56, it was hard to leave home. As he says, even us old guys get homesick. Now Ken is a union leader in Fort McMurray in Alberta, where he moved with his wife to find work. He realizes that the 3,500 oil tar sand workers will soon face the same plight as his Bathurst colleagues. He knows climate change is real and that fossil fuels have a limited future. Most of the workers in Fort McMurray have moved there out of necessity as they lost their jobs in other mines and failed industries. In Ken's words, and I quote, they know the tide is coming in. They just want to prepare themselves to move on to a new job. He believes that preparation is a better way than resistance. Sharon Burrow, another good friend, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, echoes Ken's calls for preparation and partnership with workers to shape a just transition. She knows it can work. In her native Australia, the town of South Augusta <coughs> faced the closure of the coal fire <coughs> sorry, power station on which the local economy depended. In the five years leading up to the plant's closure in 2016, the workers, local businesses, citizens and the union came together to forge a just transition plan. The plan was informed by research that found that a solar thermal plant was the best option for a smooth skill transfer from the coal-powered plant and for a long-term clean energy solution. The solar plant would create 1,800 jobs and would save 5 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. But it would also support the wider community to thrive and reap the benefits of a zero-carbon future. The need for a just transition has arisen in the last few weeks in the context of peat production here in Ireland. For decades, workers in communities all around the Midlands have earned a living and served the people of Ireland by harvesting peat to heat our homes and power our industries. However, we now know that peat is the worst of fossil fuels we burn for energy. The motives to end our peat harvesting activities are indisputable. Peat generates less energy per tonne than coal and produces higher CO2 emissions per unit. Burning it is an inefficient and polluting way to create energy. There's no economic argument for manipulating peat as a fuel source or subsidizing its production, although in 2016 the sector received 115 million euros in subsidies to generate peat fired electricity. However, the need for an urgent end to peat extraction mustn't undermine the rights of the communities whose lives are dependent on the laws. There needs to be a long-term strategy in place that ensures the rights and dignity of the people whose lives are impacted by this transition. With the right support from the government and through partnership with workers and unions, Ford Nomona has the opportunity to plan and deliver a just transitional strategy to end the use of peak for energy production by 2028, or I would say even earlier. Ken and Sharon's experiences show the importance of dialogue, partnership, and planning in shaping a just transition. So the imperative is to start that planning now. I'm pleased to be an honorary member of a group of business leaders called the B Team. I'm not a businesswoman, but an honorary um, <laughs> businesswoman. Um, our mission is to catalyze a better way of doing business for the well-being of people and planet. I co-chair the B Team's working group on net zero emissions, 
that aims to reduce emissions to zero by 2050 through a just transition. That's what the companies are committed to. Business leaders that join this progressive team commit to ensuring that their ambitious transition plans account for the positive and negative impacts on workers and communities and work in partnership with stakeholders to ensure that the transition is both just and fair. Companies giving this leadership include Kerny, Unilever, Dow, Tiffany, Natura, and Safaricon. They share their progress and experiences towards the twin goals of decarbonization and just transition with their peers, and are committed to sharing an annual report on the progress that they're making. The first progress report was published in January this year, and shows companies taking their initial steps to understand and plan for a just transition. They're doing this informed by the Just Transition Grant Services developed by the Just Transition Center of the International Trade Union Congress and the BT, as well as the International Labour Organization, ILO, guidelines for a just transition towards exter 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 environmentally sustainable economics and societies for all. The progress report shows companies on a just transition pathway. They have a long way to go, but they're sharing what they're learning along the way in the hope of inspiring others to follow their lead. For example, I'll just pick this one, Natura, a beauty product company based in Brazil, invites its workers to training sessions and meetings to discuss its net zero strategy and how it could affect the workforce and the wider community, and they're planning ahead. Social dialogue and right to participation lie at the heart of a just transition. The worst thing a com company can do is deny that change is going to happen and fail to prepare and engage workers, suppliers, and the wider community for the inevitable. Coal miners, oil, gas, and peat workers all need to have an active role in deciding what they want their future to be. It cannot be imposed on them. It takes time and investment to ensure that companies remain vibrant and jobs secure. Workers need support to reskill and access to training to find new jobs, or, if close to retirement age, to gain early access to their pensions. The right to participate and to be part of this decision making is key. The Just Transition Centre and B-Team Business Guide to a just, Transitions, a just Transition identifies three key steps companies and governments need to take, in addition to having clear policies and plans on both climate actions and human rights. And I'd like to present these briefly uh, because they're all involved in shaping a just transition in the Irish and international context. The first step is to engage employers, workers and unions, as well as government, communities and civil society in a just transition planning dialogue. The second is to plan with all stakeholders to develop a concrete, time-bound company and se sectoral strategy for a just transition. And finally, all stakeholders must enact the strategy. Social protection will be critical to protect people who lose their jobs while they reskill and find new jobs. There's a role for government to provide a social protection system, that all, uh, but also for companies to ensure that contributions and taxes are paid in full so that the workers can claim health benefits, social welfare, pensions, etc. Investment will also be needed in education and training so that the oil and gas workers of today, for example, can retrain and upskill as a solar engineer an IT specialist, or whatever they want to reinvent themselves as. Change is, as you know, inevitable, and planning for it is key. As Board and Roman moves to seize the opportunity it sees in its renewable and fossil fuel free future, parallel efforts must ensure that the workers are supported in finding the path to their future too. As it winds down its peak business, which I believe it can do probably in advance of the 2028 target, it will need to spearhead a collaborative and inclusive effort to develop new businesses to support the low carbon economy and create some 400 to 500 jobs across the Midlands. There's a country you can look to, Spain. Spain can inspire us, where the government recently announced plans to shut down most of its coal mines by the end of this year, after government and unions struck a deal that will mean 250 million euro will be invested in a just transition in mining regions over the next decade. This type of investment is critical if we're to adopt a leave no one behind approach to the transition away 
from coal, peat, oil, and gas in Ireland. A core principle of climate justice is the right to participate in climate decision making, and that's why it's imperative to engage all stakeholders, both as governments, workers, businesses, citizens, and unions, in dialogue about what lies ahead, to engage, plan, and enact a just transition together so that fear is minimized and replaced with hope and opportunity. Ultimately, we must recognize not just how we power our economies and our societies, but how we build fairer structures that ensure all people can be part of the transition to a fairer and safer and healthier world. We need to move rapidly to a zero carbon future. We either do that justly or unjustly. A just transition will leave no one behind, not the pastoralists in Hindu's community, the miners in Fort Augusta, or the peace workers in the Midlands of Ireland. A just transition will uphold rights and empower people to play their part in achieving a zero carbon world. You know, having been a High Commissioner of Human Rights, I always fall back on the UN uh, Declaration for Human Rights. And Article 1, the very beginning of it states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. In times of great change, these rights must be protected. And this year, the Declaration is 70 year, years old. The world has changed immeasurably in that period of time, yet the principles and values that underpin the Declaration and our shared humanity remain more relevant than ever. Two of the many great women who inspired me in my life are Eleanor Roosevelt, who led the process that resulted in the UN Declaration of Human Rights after World War II, and Langari Mathai, the leader of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. And I would like to end with words of inspiration for each of them. Firstly, from Eleanor Roosevelt, in a speech that she gave at the Sorbonne in Paris in 1948. She said, The future must see the broadening of human rights throughout the world. People who have glimpsed freedom will never be content until they have secured it for themselves. In the truest sense, human rights are a fundamental object of law and government in a just society. And Gary Mackay picked up the same sentiment a, 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 a few decades later when she said, in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to switch to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. That time has come. Thank you very much.
ladies and gentlemen, to our host, Olam Beansha. It's easy for them to recruit peoples 
because they don't have what to eat, what to drink, and they are ready to accept anything to their dignity. When I say the dignity, because culturally in my region, man has the responsibility to feed his family. He has to take care of his family. If he cannot do that, he found himself without any dignity. And dignity is a very important thing for every human being, and for us it works, because if this man cannot feed his family, he cannot confirm himself as man. So he has to do it. So he has only two ways. Either he joins the group because the purpose is money for him, or either he has to live very far to become a migrant at the regional level or international level. He has to jump to the sea and reach Europe or whatever where he can find the better life. So it's the issue of the survivor where the climate change who is the environmental issues but become a security issues for the peoples in my region. Those impacts become a huge issue for us. But as the local communities there, we cannot be stay without solutions. That's why I'm also happy, like Mary said, to visit the stand outside where growing the ideas for the climate solutions. So from my communities, the climate solution come from our traditional knowledge, where we have the observations. We observe the trees clouds, the sky, the start position, the wind direction, the animal behaviors, and that helps us to predict the weather. Prediction of the weather, not saying it's sunny, you have to use the sun glasses, raining umbrella, no. It has to tell us when are we going to move from north to south, from east to west, because this is our planning for adaptation to the climate change. So those knowledge, we develop that since centuries. And that's what keep us alive and give us hope to get our survival. But the traditional knowledge are very sustainable, but it's not enough because climate is changing worse and worse every day. So that's why personally I'm using my community history, my personal history on the climate impact to take it at the international level where we are taking the decision on our survival and our planned survival. I'm attending the climate negotiations and I'm so grateful for the Paris Agreement for the first time after 20 years of the negotiation, we get the five references of indigenous peoples with the human rights, participation, just a transition that very well presented by Mary, and also recognition of indigenous people's traditional knowledge where we are working on the platform now. I was also lucky to be on the Paris Agreement signature as the ambassador said, this was a very exciting moment to be in front of the head of state and talking on behalf of the all civil society. But for me, I didn't saw them as the head of state because my mind was with my communities and all the 400 million indigenous people who are getting impacted. In my head was, are them going to get the Paris Agreement as a great best for solution for those people who didn't create climate change but getting impacted. But luckily, yes, in small time, because they took it to the Security Council this year, where the Security Council started discussing the climate change as a security risk for the world. So for me, this is very important to go beyond just to the climate convention, but also to the General Assembly, to the Security Council, and become all the world humanities. So each action for me is very important. Ireland has also the solutions, 
that I saw outside. But each individual solution is very important. It can impact positively or negatively a thousand miles away where my people are living. Negatively, when we do not shift to the just transitions to the real solutions and we continue doing the worst with our planet. So that will impact my people's negatively. Positively, each individual action, it can be into water, it can be in the trees, it can be in conservation, in one way or another, will impact us positively. Because everybody here need three things. Everybody drink water, so we need water to survive. Everybody breathes air, because we need air to survive. And everybody have a food in his kettles to survive. So those three things, you can be rich or poor, from north or south, white or black, children or elder, you need that to your survival. So as long as we keep those three items, Sustainably, we keep our planet clean and we serve my people. I cannot forgive to do not serve my people. That's why I'm so happy to be here and hopefully you will help me to serve my people. Thank you so much. existential threat to people who are living in countries that are on the margins, on the margins of fragility. What the IPCC report really brought home to me when I read it was that it is already too late for many of the communities that we are working in. This is not about reducing the impact on communities where the damage is already done. Since the beginning of the industrial age, we have put in motion a series of events that are going to last well beyond any actions we take now. We bear a huge burden of responsibility in the developed countries that have most caused this disruption for trying to put a halt on, for trying to break the cycle of environmental destruction and innovation. If I were still in Malawi, where I spent the last three years, in the month of November, I would typically be out visiting households and communities who are preparing their fields for the rainy season, otherwise known as the hungry season. The hungry season traditionally would last from December to March. The hungry season being the hungry season because the plants are in the field and they're growing and people are waiting, waiting for harvest which would start in March. Now in the last number of years, 
rainfall in Malawi and other parts of southern and eastern Africa, which I'd be more familiar with than the Sahel, has been incredibly erratic, and this is directly derived from climate change. Farmers wait and wait with planting rains. <coughs> it is crucial that you plant during the planting rains. It is crucial that the rain continues to fall in the right quantities, dispersed appropriately over the right period of time. If not, if, as has happened year upon year now in Malawi, there's a 10 day, two week, even three week break in rainfall, you lose your crop. Most farmers in Malawi, and smallholder farmers in Malawi make up 92% of the 17 million people in that country, will not be able to replenish their seed stock and plant again. They have lost their entire harvest for the year ahead. Suddenly the hungry season goes from three to four months to 12 months or longer, and the cycle of impoverishment continues like that. If I may be somewhat controversial, organizations like Trocra, Concern, Goal, fantastic, very, very strong Irish NGOs that have been working for 40 to 50 years in the field of building resilience to hunger, eradicating extreme poverty. We are finding that much as we have tremendous support from the Irish government from our work, much as we see the ODA budget increasing and we're very grateful for that, and we should all be proud of an Irish government that has set about changing uh, its approach to aid to increase it, as well as have a very strong quality of aid. But at the same time, how are we performing on climate change? And when you think about it long term, if Ireland doesn't pull together, change our policy around climate change, we're potentially doing more damage to the people and countries that we're working in than we could ever hope to resolve through our sustainable agriculture and livelihood programs. What we see here in Ireland, you mentioned we work in Ireland, we work overseas. In our engagement with the Irish population in schools, in communities, in churches, we find that people are far ahead of the politics of climate change. There's a huge movement here. Here in Trinity College, Trinity was the first university in Ireland to divest from fossil fuels in 2016. The government agreed to divest this summer. The Irish Catholic Bishops Conference agreed to divest a couple of months ago. So a movement was started by the students here in this institution. There's a movement happening popularly here in Ireland, which we need to see reflected at the political level. So I think there's a big challenge for all of us, reflecting that you know, the Irish government had a target of reducing our emissions by 20% by 2020. At best, at best, those emissions will be reduced by 1%. And thereafter, they will continue to grow, not decrease, until 2030. This goes against everything that we need to now, fortunately, there are ways in which we can change this. I think Mary has given a tremendous presentation focusing on transitional justice. What we need to do are to take bold steps, but bold steps that are set in the context of ensuring that the people who are vulnerable overseas in countries where we have a long tradition and history through mission work and development work and monetary response are working and to people who are living in our own society and environment who are potentially affected by changes in government policy to ensure that they're protected from the outcomes of those policy changes. Let me hand back to Paul. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. I think, that, I think that talks about the challenge that we have in Ireland of, of trying to do our best at home and internationally and, and the challenges that Trogra has. So I'm going to open it up to any, any questions in the audience and I'm going to just ask you to introduce yourself and, and keep your question short and, and make it a question, not a statement. So I see a hand up here. We have about 10 minutes to question. Just a brief question. Uh, just first, I, I found that image from our distinguished guest from Chad really quite uh, moving. This idea of 50 degrees centigrade temperatures, you know, that our life choices are literally setting uh, in indigenous people almost on fire. But just to, uh, I don't think it's a smartphone light but I'm trying to, um, the question I really want to ask is uh, in Ireland, our being, the reason we're laggards basically is because of agriculture. It plays a huge role, but much more importantly, our own personal choices in failing to consider the moral implications of our diet, to move away from meat and dairy consumption, which is lethal for our health, our health anyway, you know, compared to plant alternatives. And I really think we can't really evade that question, can we? I mean, we're all good friends here. This is the big issue. This is the only way as individuals in the here and now we can make a radical difference by changing our diet. <laughs> Well, 
All right, thank you very much for your, uh, for your talks that were very inspired. Uh, I want to ask, of course, the only long-term solution to what's happening in Chad right now is to change the carbon footprint and climate change. But what would you like to see uh, as a short-term solution to uh, replace people joining Boko Haram, for instance? Are there any uh, initiatives that aren't being taken by local governments in your region or by NGOs uh, that you'd like to see? Thank you. Uh, well, my question to you is, uh, Jennifer, uh, I was mentioned by several people was how developing nations are often most hit by the actions of the developed world. Uh, I feel like we're seeing a troubling trend in the developed world of people fearing to take responsibility for the damage that we are doing. What are ways that we can encourage people to take a, response of, a sense of responsibility for the world and how they can make it a one for everyone and not just in the place they're from. Thank you. So we've come on, on individual responsibility and how to give that sense of responsibility. And that specific question, which I think is really important about, about talking about Chad and conflict, because uh, it's, it's not widely known that conflict uh, can be directly related to climate change. And we've seen that in Syria, and there's peer review research to in the Mediterranean, so perhaps you could address that question first. <laughs> yeah, so I can like, um, comment. So when you see the degree rising, you see the climate impacted people. So we have about 80% of people who depending from the environment as a country. 80% living in the real areas. And when those natural resources are healthy, of course, the conflicts, the conflict between them separate, as I told you. So when we are pastoralists, we have the corridor that we use, and we have the water point where we stop. When we move two days, so we walk like some kilometers, we stop. And this place where we stop is has to be a big place for us and for our cattle. And then we move to another one. This way of life protects the environment because our sheep cows fertilize the land. For us, it's a strategy because in our way back, we can find another new pasture. So we keep the environment in balance with our life. But what is happening when we move, because the land is fertile, you have the agriculture people who come. Like farms start in this, in this place. In our way back, the land is not there, it's gone. So either we have to go away very far, and it's so hard for the cattle, for the people who work in 50 degrees, to find water, to find place, either we have to stop and fight with those people. So this conflict needs to be resolved in order to save the people who are joining the territory too. And how it can be resolved is a land issue. There is a land grabbing issues who is happening there, but local land grabbing. So that need is strong political will, but it's not enough. It needs a financial support. It needs an alternative livelihood. So how they can build the capacity of the young people who are around the place, who also deserve life, and who also deserve the fertile land, to give them this alternative. You know, in these people, in my community, to now, 21st century, people do not have a birth certificate. This is the basic thing everyone must have in order to say I'm a citizen of this country, right? So they don't have it. Why do they not have it? Because there's no school. Then you don't talk about the hospital or clean water or other things. So the basic development issues need to be set up in order to allow a sustainable development and keep the people from the terrorist group. When you have also a support from the uh, external countries, 
we have uh, France, but we have also EU, and now we have America, who give it a billions to keep the peace in the regions. But the peace in the region that they are keeping is how they can enforce the army to make the security. So as long as we disconnect the army security and development of the peoples, that can never work. It has to be hand by hand. Of course, we need army to secure the region, fight those terrorist groups. But we need also to invest on the peoples that can be recruited easily, to keep them busy on their life by giving them an alternative work. <laughs> Capacity building, money, and that they can feel, I don't need to do this to work because I have whatever that I have. I have to protect my land, my peoples, and then it becomes much secure. So that's the gap we still have now. So we need to fill this gap absolutely. And coming to this individual in each world can help. As you said in Ivan here, you have your agriculture system. But from my experience, the family agriculture is much sustainable than industrialized agriculture. So that's also an individual choice. And using this choice by what you can eat, how you can waste, that's also an individual choice. Who can contribute a lot to the global choice? Ending by what's the responsibility of the developing developed countries vis-a-vis -vis to the developing countries, this is very important. Developing countries didn't create the climate impact. The industrialized revolution created the climate impact. But of course, maybe it was a mistake. People didn't know that it's going to lead us to this. But now everyone knows the climate is a reality. Developed country cannot deny that. We had the fire in Portugal. Even we have the fire here also in the island. We have the fire in the US, in Canada. We had the flood in France last, last month, or these months also. We have flooding even in New York, in London. Is it normal how many years that they used to have the fire and the flooding? I don't think that they used to have it normal. So this is also one of the climate impact. So thinking about the impact is now in our countries, in our peoples, but tomorrow is going to be worse in developed countries if they do not take the action now. So take the action for yourself and then you can save us if you don't want to take action for those people that we do not know. But coming from my three world, we have these three issues to share together. Anyway, you need water to drink, you need clean air to breathe, you need food in your table. So think about that. Think about your new generation that's coming up to leave them with the better world. Because this is a big gift that we have and we must share equally among the humanity. We must share the air, the water, the food equally. And in order to share it, we have to give all the justice by respecting the developing peoples in the developing countries. Uh, Behavior. The other thing maybe just to spend a bit more time on is how does behavior change happen? 
I bet everybody in this room believes in the right thing to do and would expect that the person beside them would know that, for example, there's a wonderful exhibition piece out there um, calling on parents to turn off their engines when they're waiting for their children outside school. And once you see it, it's so obvious, and you go, of course, of course I should. But it's only when practices become socially unacceptable that actually people default to the more appropriate behaviour. So we need to continually, those of us who are thinking, you know, I'd like to do this, but people might laugh at me, or, you know, every, not everybody's doing it, therefore what's the point? We have to create a critical mass of behaviour in order to tip the balance. The other thing that's important about social behaviour change is that most people might walk around thinking, my values state that it is important to, uh, for can say, cycle to work rather than, rather than take the car. However, again, everybody else driving their car, it's rainy and wet in Ireland, and oh look, you know, what difference will it make? But if you think, actually, 7 out of the 10 people that I come in contact with are probably thinking, I know it's the right thing to cycle, but I'm going to drive. The more those people actually change their behaviour, talk to each other, and reinforce each other's attitude around the changes that need to happen through their own personal action, the more it becomes actually socially unacceptable to take the easier option, which is the option that damages the environment. So what I'm saying is that we need to influence each other. So we need to talk about these issues, be champions, keep on reiterating them. Our children will come home from school telling us what the right things and the wrong things do are. Pay them respect, give them time and attention, reinforce their views through the actions that we take. My colleague Dr. Lorna Gold wrote a fantastic book, which I think everybody should really pay attention to, because as and we've just heard, it is about our children's future. These issues are affecting our lives. And so the more people realise that actually it's not just about something terrible happening in a faraway country that I really have no control or influence over. It's actually my children that will suffer from potential flooding or increased insurance costs or poor air quality or higher costs of healthcare. So ensuring that there's an awareness of that and reinforcing positive actions to our own behaviours, they're probably the best way to drive change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lord has spoken about this bill on marketplace there. We can take a few more questions now if there's any other. Uh, I see a gentleman there, and you can come on over there. So we'll take those three. Yes, thank you. Uh, Forrest Humboldt, I'm here on behalf of the Netherlands Embassy here in Dublin. And my question is regarding those changes that people can do in their daily lives. Um, there's a lot of uh, bad options for the environment, eating meat, driving your car. However, for most people, most of the bad options are usually the easier options, are usually also the cheaper options. The problem with the big changes is that mostly the poorer people will be affected by the needs for the change. If we um, really prohibit those other things or tax them, the poorer people will be, um, will be hit the hardest, same as now the poorer countries are hit the hardest. So, my question is, how will we deal with this social inequality arising from that? Thank you. Hi there, Deirdre Bain from Shamrock Spring, I'm here at Woodstock to be able to join you today. We had an amazing visit recently from Pope Francis and a book about out of sea. Is it possible that the divestment of funds from the church can be reinvested locally in every parish, every school, retrofit, community buildings for starters? And maybe with a French bank support rather than an Irish bank, can we have a green retail financial tool that we can use to have sustainable energy in our own homes? That the avoid having to create greenhouse gas, create jobs, and can be a very viable future for just transition. Um, Jane Hattick from Alpashka. I'm interested to know about population and how we can talk about a sustainable global population that is in line with climate because, you know, I wonder if in your country in Chad, as a result of the crisis that you're facing, um, do, do family numbers increase, do they decrease, you know, where, where can we have these type of conversations about the fact that there's 7 billion of us on the planet and we can't all consume the same amount of you know, resources. 
and, and we lead to conflict. So I don't know if, if, if you have any opinion or, or any insight into that. Okay. Thank you. So, Andy, would you like to address that? that comment there on population and consumption, and first, your questions? Uh, yeah, sure. So, about populations, of course, we say we do not have enough resources, but we cannot stop people from growing up, from giving babies. That's for sure, right? So, uh, it depends on how it works. So, in Chad, we have a very small population. The land is 1,200,000 kilometers squares like uh, two times uh, France, uh, three times Germany, so the line is really big. We have a different ecosystem. We have 100% desert, we have savanna and Sahel, and then we have tropical forest in the deep. And that means we have more population in the southern place than the north. And that's the issue of there is not enough water in the desert area, so people moving to that place. But coming to the population growing, so when you have a communities without job, you found that they have more kids than those who are busy having job or having other issues. So that's really exactly what's happening there. Because you have no job, your agriculture is not giving, and then you are just there. You have no other work to do. Maybe the consolation that you have is making babies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's natural, right? If we talk seriously, it's really natural. So you cannot stop them by saying you don't have something to eat, you have to make babies. And then the normal, I don't know, excuse or reality is coming up, it's kids giving by God. You cannot stop them. That's what's happening. And that takes us to another discussion who is uh, for the family plan. The family planning is not the issues coming up in the developing countries, not only China. Most of the developing countries, we do not talk about it because there are other emerging issues that we talk about. So this is become marginalized discussions. But it's a very important discussion because we need a family planning in order to plan our life and plan whatever revenue that we are going to have become from a pastoralist who I am or from uh, someone who's going to the office who's rich. So you need that for your health. You need that for your future. But it's not a discussion that's happening. We have other priorities as food, water, security. So as long as you can address food, water, security, of course you can have a body somewhere to discuss about the family planning and then family growing. So this is not an actual discussion that we are having, but at least we do not have a big population growing compared to our neighbor with Niger, where they are going to have like 50% more just in 2050. And that when you think about how they are going to feed those people, how they are going to get them to school, to the health, so it's become a completely like the sustainable development goal discussions. So that's why in my answer I come to you, we can address climate change, but we cannot cut only climate change without talking about development, about security, about water, about all. So all the 15 goals of the sustainable development need to be addressed in a same block to the developing countries. So when we address them in the same block, maybe by 2030, we can achieve some of them. I'm not confident that we are going to address goal of 2030, but I'm com I will be confident if we address them all together, but by making priority, we need to address climate change as cross-cutting issues through all our development. We cannot have the sustainable development if we do not have these cross-cutting issues, talking with the peoples and taking the solution from the ground, not coming with already designed mechanisms, but from ground. I'm going to end by, uh, because yes, your question inspired me to the gender issues also, because when we talk about population ground, we talk about gender. So when we talk about the climate change and we have gender, and then life is a little bit separate. Okay, let's talk about women and climate change. It's very interesting. I'm like, excuse me, you cannot talk about women and climate change because
because it is interesting. Woman is part of the solution. Human in past is part of the human being. So if there is problem, she's the most impacted. She is the one in my communities who is giving the information to her kids. Where they grow up, they are passing the traditional knowledge, but also the education to how you can protect your water, your trees. How is your relation as human being and your environment? So all those need to become like a cross-cutting issues, and of course it's become very naturally to integrate the human growing population into the climate protection or global environmental protection. Thank you. We have the attention to the Finally, on the question around, um, you know, what about the people who are disproportionately affected by vulnerability here in our societies as well? I think, you know, Mary's intervention earlier really sets the framework. The transition to a climate just society has got to acknowledge and respond to the fact that people will have different needs at different times. In Malawi, where I live for three years, I see my former colleague who's the regional director for that region here, we worked on shock sensitive social protection social protection that responds to the risk of an emergency. Here in Ireland, we need to look at social protection that responds to the needs of a climate-just economy and society. We need to step back, take a bigger framework, and not let things get in our way. Thank you.